Hey friends, welcome to the Old Fashioned On Purpose podcast. We are wrapping up this season and I thought it would be fun today to give you some personal updates about what I've been doing, what I have going on. And also uh, within that, I wanted to talk a little bit about a type of unconventional homesteading that we didn't hit on yet in the season. And that is homesteading in a super duper small rural community, what that's like, tips for breaking into those communities, and why I think they're an incredible place to build a homestead and to invest into. So I hope you enjoyed the season as much as I did. Uh, I enjoyed getting to talk to all the different guests and touch on some different ways of viewing homesteading and walks of life that we haven't talked a lot about um, on this podcast thus far. We talked to people who are multi-generational homesteading, uh, people with chronic health concerns, people who are in the golden years, people who are homesteading solo, people who are homesteading in really harsh climates. And I hope it inspired you that regardless of your situation, even if you didn't have the exact situation as some of the folks in the season, that regardless, it is possible for you to partake in this lifestyle in some way, shape, or form. Because at the end of the day, homesteading isn't about having the perfect amount of animals or the prescribed amount of acreage or living in the perfect homestead location. It's really about your mindset and how you're choosing to move through life with intention. And that can be done anywhere. And like I was talking about with my guests on my previous episode, when I was chatting with Allison, you know, it's homesteading isn't just a hobby or a niche. It's really a set of skills that kind of define us as humans. And it's only in very recent history that we've had the luxury of leaving those behind. And all homesteading is, in my opinion, is recapturing those skills of understanding how to feed ourselves, understanding how to be producers instead of consumers, um, understanding how to immerse ourselves in nature, which is really what our body craves. So in my opinion, that's homesteading. And you definitely don't need 60 acres and a milk cow to get that done. So um, let's start off. I'll give you a little bit of a personal update with me and my life. I haven't talked too much about that since we've been so busy talking to all these interesting guests. Uh, at the time of this recording, it is June. And June, as I'm sure you know, and you can relate with, it is crazy on a homestead, especially um, when you have lots of irons in the fire. So I came out of my book writing stupor around the end of May. I sent the first version of the manuscript into my editor, still waiting to hear back, which is like you send this baby of yours into this black hole for an unknown amount of time. And you're just waiting to hear uh, what she thinks. Anyway, so I sent that off and then I kind of awoke and I'm like, whoa, I'm behind on all of my life. My life was like in a holding pattern as I was writing, you know, a million hours a day. So I've been trying to catch up and it's been a lot. Um, combine that with, you know, all the gardening and all the springtime stuff. And we have different events that we're hosting a horsemanship clinic next week and our big chili cook-off, which is our biggest day of the year for the soda fountains happening tomorrow. Uh, we have company coming and we had a film crew here doing a documentary filming. So uh, I, I haven't been posting a lot on social media just because I kind of am drowning and people, you know, I've talked about this before. They say, how do you get it all done? Well, sometimes I don't. And on seasons like this, there are things that just fall by the wayside. Um, so my house has not been super clean. My garden is kind of weedy. Um, I didn't get home. My flower is planted till way later. So we're just putting one foot in front of the other at this point, but I know you guys can relate because regardless of where you are, summer and especially early summer is a little crazy. So um, I am working on a plan to have more intermittent YouTube videos up. In fact, I have my assistant Kayla. She is here in Wyoming with us. She used to work remotely and now she moved here. So we were editing a video, uh, actually just before I hit record on this episode and we're going to have, um, hopefully I, I won't say weekly. I'm not going to commit to weekly videos, but you'll see some occasional videos over on YouTube. I'm going to try to bring that back in a little bit. Um, we still have blog posts going up on the blog and the podcast, of course, that you're already listening to. And I'll try to be a little more present on social media. But, you know, people have asked me, where did you go? Because I was super consistent with content creation. Um, and I think I will come back and be a little more present than I have been. But at this point in time, I kind of just am living the life in front of me and trying to get that stuff under control. So that's the scoop. That's where I am. If you haven't seen me as much on Instagram, just give you a little behind the scenes. Um Speaking of behind the scenes, I don't think I ever gave you guys an official 
um, update on the soda fountain as far as like when we finished it, well, we actually finished it fairly recently. It was about a year long project. We hit our one year anniversary of purchasing it uh, April 21st of this year. So that was our full year. And that was about the time when we wrapped up construction. And I've given you little glimpses of it here and there on social media and on the podcast, but just to kind of put a nice little bow on it, since it's officially complete or, you know, stuff's always going to break and need updated, but it's complete as it needs to be for now. Um, but it's done. It's, it's running. We are busier than ever this summer. Thank you so much to everyone who listens to this podcast and follows me online who stopped by. There's been a ton of you and it's been so fun to meet you guys. I'm not always there just so you know, I don't work there seven days a week, but, um, I love connecting with those of you who I happen to be there and you swing by and it's so great to, to meet you and shake your hand and hear your stories. So it's been really humbling, uh, to see the amount of support we've had from my online audience with this local business, like totally didn't, didn't expect that. Um, we did stay open the entire time during the remodel, which was brutal at certain points of the process when we had like plastic tarps taped up to try to separate the construction zone from the dining room. And it was noisy. And I had to apologize to customers who were like, you know, listening to the sound of hammers and drills. Uh, Most people were super accommodating and kind about it. Um, But I'm really glad to be done with that. I would say running a restaurant in the middle of construction chaos has not been my favorite thing. It it was very stressful. Uh, I was thinking back to last summer when we were redoing the sewer lines in the backyard, as well as having the inside of the restaurant like ripped to shreds. Uh, Christian discovered that the lines were ancient and had tree roots growing through them. So we had to rip them up and start over. So he had like a excavator in the backyard and this is in town. So it's not a big backyard. And there was like, we had like caution tape. So it was like a crime scene to keep people from falling in the open hole. And there was dirt everywhere. And my employees were stressed out. And I was thinking back as we now I'm walking through the yard like yesterday and it's green and we have the grass replanted and it's peaceful. And I'm like, I'm glad we did it, but I, I don't want to go do that again in, in the near future. Cause it was, it was a lot. And that's kind of why I, I stepped back from some of my online presence last summer. Cause it was just survival mode, but all in all, I'm glad we did it. And I'm proud of us for do- doing it. It was absolutely our hardest project to date, but it was worth it. And like I talk about so often, just because something is hard doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. It just means it's probably going to be hard and you're going to have to find some grit within yourself to get the job done. But the response with it from the community and um, the customers has been so rewarding. Uh, Our goal in the remodel was to take it back to the 1920s, which was really the heyday of soda fountains. And you can see pictures online. I'll do, I need to do a little better about posting on the, the Chugwater soda fountain, Instagram and Facebook pages. Um, but we, we tried to do as much vintage fixtures and feel and decor as we could while still keeping it a functional business. Um, and that was an interesting dance. I mean, I've done a lot of projects. Christian and I, have, we love projects, but our projects have always been for us, especially like around our homestead. So it was a very different experience to do a project where the whole community is watching you. And some people, I'll be very honest, were waiting for us to fail. So that was a lot of pressure. Um, it was intense at some times and you had a lot of opinions. So you're, you're working on this project and you have the vision, but you have people standing over your shoulder saying, well, I don't like that, or you shouldn't do this. Or what if you try this instead? So it was, um, it was a growing experience. And I feel like it was a necessary part of our journey as Christian and I continue to follow this entrepreneurial path and figure out how to invest in other businesses and continue to be business owners it was like that next level of trial by fire. Like, okay, so you can build stuff on your homestead. Cool. But now you're going to build stuff in public and it's a whole different game. Um, but also, again, humbling to have the community come together and support us as well. Hey friends, I'm going to interrupt this episode for just a sec to answer a question that a lot of you have been asking me lately. And that is, do I still love my Harvest Guard reusable canning lids? So last year I did a video about these lids and it kind of went viral and we ended up creating a backlog of orders for the Harvest Guard company. So it was kind of crazy, but as a result, a lot of you watched that video and were curious to know if I still like these lids all these months later. And my answer is yes, I absolutely do. Uh, I love that I can buy them once. I don't have to rebuy them constantly, which right now in this world of crazy, unforeseen shortages of materials, that's a huge bonus. 
Also, the sustainable part of me just really likes the fact that something isn't going into the garbage every single time I open a jar of home canned food. I will say my one caveat with these lids is that they do have a little bit of a learning curve. So I would recommend that you can your first batch with water. And if you wanna see the whole process of how they work, because they're a little bit different than your typical metal lids, I'm gonna drop a link to that video where I showed you how to use them down in the show notes of this video. But if you wanna try them for canning season this year, you can do so over at theprairiehomestead.com slash canning lids. And if you use code homestead, you'll save 15% on your order. Now, back to our episode. Another interesting phenomenon that I ran up against, or we ran up against during this process, um, and that was how much people hate change, even good change. And it caught me off guard a little bit. I think I kind of thought I knew that, but I didn't know it, know it. And it was interesting to navigate. Um, I'm going to try to say this without stepping on any toes, but I think it's really important to talk about this. So here I go. We'll see if I get angry people emailing me after this. But okay, so first off, I just have to say far and above, we've had tons of positive uh, feedback from the changes. It's cleaner. It smells better. Everything is is functional and operational. We've upgraded the food. Like we've upgraded the plates. We've upgraded everything in the restaurant. It's, it's just a much better experience. And most of the people who come in it's so fun to see the reaction because if, especially if they were in it before that you can, they're just like their mouths hanging open and it's so fun. Uh, and Christian, I spent a lot of time like agonizing over choices of what colors and what type of tile and how do we honor the history of the building, but still make it functional. And what happens when we, we, we pull out the bar where the soda fountain is and then like the floor is rotted to pieces. And, you know, we thought we could save it, but then we couldn't. And then you have people standing over our shoulder, like, are you going to save the bar? And we're like, we physically can't because it's like rotted and it's black and the wood is crumbling. So you have all these dynamics, but um, it's been interesting, even though it's better, it's so much better than it was. I, I've had a number of people, women primarily, uh, like come in, some have, have emailed, some have told my employees, like they will look, look us in the eye and say, you ruined this. You ruined this. And they use the word ruined. Three different people have used the word ruined. And it's fascinating to me because I think, I mean, we all have different opinions and uh, ideas of what is beautiful, what is not beautiful. I would say that it's pretty, would be pretty fair across the board to say it looks better than it did, just for a lot of reasons. If you can go look at the pictures online to see if you agree, and if you don't, that's fine. Um, but it, honestly, when I heard those comments after the money and the time and the, the sweat we've poured into the projects, it kind of hurt my feelings. Like it hurt my feelings a lot because I'm like, you guys have no idea what, how we invested in this. Uh, in every aspect of our life. But then I had to sit back and think like, why are they saying this? And I realized it wasn't necessarily that they hated everything we did, but it was that this idea of change is hard for us. And a lot of times I think as humans, we push against change, even good change, because it feels uncomfortable. Even if it's just a business that you've been frequenting, frequenting um, maybe it feels uncomfortable when they change something up or they repaint a wall or they don't offer the thing you, you used to buy there. So that's been a lesson uh, just kind of reacquainting myself with that. And I, I would say, if you want to take away from this episode, because it's, you know, got to, we're covering a lot of ground here, but a takeaway would be is, are there, ask yourself, are there areas in your life where you are resistant to change just for the sake of holding on to the old ways that may or may not serve you? And that's a weird thing maybe for me to say, because you know, I love old things. I love old fashioned ways. I love uh, old ways of doing things, but sometimes those old ways aren't always the best. Um, and sometimes it requires us to leave the okay behind so we can really reach for the much better. So that's just something I've been chewing on and uh, it's been good. It's, it's taught me, I think, to be a lot more resilient towards criticism. You know, I, I thought I was pretty good at dealing with criticism after 10 years of having an online business because people online are pretty nasty sometimes. Not, a, not everybody. There's a lot of good people. But there's some nasty people. Um, Turns out people like, you know, in person can be almost nastier. <laughs> it's just a different dynamic. But I feel like um, it's a part of the process of growth for Christian and I is to learn how to handle that and how to be confident in what we're doing moving forward, regardless of the feedback. Because if you are, I mean, even the good feedback, I love the good feedback and I appreciate the support. But if I put all of my stock in someone telling me good job, 
then it's going to make me very susceptible to when someone tells me I hate you and everything you're doing, right? So it's being able to listen to those pieces, but then continue to set our gaze forward and do what we know we need to do regardless of what people say, good or bad. And again, that's something I, that applies to us all, whether you're homesteading and people around you think you're crazy for homesteading or you want to homeschool your kids and people think you're ridiculous for pulling them out of the public school system. Um, or you want to start a business and everyone tells you you're going to fail and that you should just just stay where you are and, and sit down and shut up. Like you're going to have to find your course and put your head down and just keep on trucking. So the Soda Found has been amazing. It's been a lot of life lessons, which I knew it would be. Whenever we get ready to take on a project, whether it's writing a book or restoring a restaurant or building a new chicken coop, one of the things Christian and I always think about is like, who will, who will we become? throughout this process and what skills, both internal and external, will we develop? And that's one of the factors that we consider. You know, when I, when I decided to take on this book, um, it was a big commitment, a lot of words, but I knew that through the process of writing this book, I would become a better thinker, a better writer. I would have a better grasp of a lot of concepts. And that's exactly what happened. So, um, that makes the hard stuff and the challenges really worth it sometimes. Not just sometimes, a lot of times. Uh, another interesting piece of how the Soda Fountain's kind of tied into our journey the last year is this idea of not hiding anymore. And you've heard me talk about that a few times here on the podcast. And it was funny to see it manifest itself in a very uh, physical way. And, and in particular, well, the whole business, like you can't hide if you're running a, a restaurant where people are coming into your space and eating and, you know, eating is an intimate act. So you're feeding them and you're serving them. You can't hide, right? You're, you're, they're there. Um, you're you're going to have to be able to stand your ground and be able to put your money where your mouth is and be able to, to be who you say you are. And if you say you're good at preparing food or you're a good business owner, you have to, you know, be able to prove that when someone's in your building versus just coming to your website. That's just a very different dynamic. So, um, really being bold with who I am and sticking with who I am has been something I've been convicted about for the last couple of years. And I feel like the soda fountain was that next step in the process. And it really kind of came to a head, believe it or not, the weekend when we painted the building. Now, some of you might've seen the pictures of this. It was, uh, it's a brick building. It's not a beautiful building. It was built in like 1914. It's, it has an old vibe, but buildings in our area we didn't have a lot of resources a hundred years ago. We didn't have a lot of trees and not a lot of money. So you don't have the big grand storefronts like some little towns do. We're kind of more humble, but the soda fountain is cool, but it's not like a spectacular facade. It's just brick and um, has some big cool windows in the front, but it was beige. It was painted the most nondescript beige and the whole town feels beigey to me because we have, the, the dirt lots and the bluffs are like a stand stony beige. And of course it's brown a lot of the year because it's so dry here. So everything's brown and beige and tan. And I'm like, cannot take another day of the tan. Uh, I've got to have some color. So I had a good friend help me figure out pink colors. And she's like, Jill, I have an idea. And she's like, just, just hear me out. And she brought out some paint samples and they were mint green. And at first I was like, oh no, 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 mm -mm, too, that's too much. And she's like, but, but like, think about it. And she showed me some pictures of other buildings, old buildings with that color scheme. And we kind of talked about combining it with a dark charcoal to kind of ground it is for trim color. And the more research I did, I started to realize that around that 1920s area, there was a lot of pastel colors. There was actually a lot of color. We, I, I kind of think of a, a lot of those uh, buildings in that era being white, 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 white. And there was actually a lot of color. If you look in um, even interiors, there was yellows and pinks and blues and greens and, and such. And the mint green was very much true to that era. And it's kind of cool because it's also very similar to the color of our Hamilton Beach milkshake machines. And so after a lot of thinking and going to Sherwin-Williams like a million times, buying a ton of different varieties of mint green and painting them in little swatches on the side of the building, we decided to go with it. Um, and kind of cool, we actually, as we started to pull off um, layers inside the building during the remodel, we found some walls that were painted mint green, pretty darn close to the shade we had selected. So I knew it was true to the era. Um, so the Saturday we painted the building and we sprayed it and uh, I just about had a meltdown because <laughs> it was so green. 
It was so green. And what I kept thinking, I was like, why am I so uncomfortable with this? Like, why am I feeling so nervous about this? I'd, I'd thought about the color for months before we did it. And I realized what it was is I'm like, I can't hide anymore. Like when you pull into town, you cannot miss the soda fountain. You see it. Like it is in your face. Not, and I don't think it's in a garish, obnoxious way, but it's like very visible in a town that's mostly brown and beige. And it looks alive and it looks bright and it looks perky and it just invites you in, but you can't miss it and you can't hide. And so I I was talking about it with Christian that day as we painted. I'm like, there's no hiding anymore. And he's like, you're absolutely right. And that was really symbolic to me just in all of my life. And and that's silly, right? I mean, obviously I wouldn't want to hide a restaurant anyway. I want people to come in. I didn't sound like I was trying to chase off customers before, but hopefully you get what I'm trying to say. Um, it's that idea of being fully seen and allowing ourselves to be fully seen. And I think that's a really good thing. And I've continued on that track this year. Um, some of you might have seen the documentary episode thing we did back in April with Justin Rhodes' Abundance Plus platform. Um, he had sent a film crew out to visit us in February. And he does an incredible job with his content on that platform. It is beyond network quality, beautifully, masterfully filmed. And he has a series called Divergence about people taking, you know, roads they didn't expect. So we were talking about the concept. He wanted to do an episode with us. We were talking about the concept. And he, you know, I've done a lot of filming and interviews. And I feel like everybody always kind of asks me the same questions. How'd you start homesteading? Where did you grow up? They're, those are fine questions, but sometimes I, I feel a little bored with them, especially 10 years of doing interviews. I like to talk about other things now. And so I told Justin that I'm like, I kind of like to take a different angle. So we talked about all the different angles we could take. And uh, he's like, what if we talk about your faith journey? Would you be open to that? And when he first brought that up, I like my stomach flip flop because um, I've talked about that very, very little uh, in public. It's, it's something that I've kind of held close to my chest. I've kind of hid that because it's a little bit tender. But as he uh, broached that, I, I knew in my gut that I was ready. I'm like, yep, you know what? I, I want to do that. And so we didn't know what that would look like. We, we had, uh, or he had his film guys who were incredible, Ben and his crew, scheduled to come. And Ben's a storyteller. So he called me and we talked about different angles and what that would look like. But Ben really also was honing in on that idea. He's like, I am so compelled by your faith journey and how it ties into everything else you've done and how it's connected. And so he's like, you know, let's do it. Let's just see what happens when they get there. And so of course, when they were here, it was 30 below zero wind chill. So it was freezing and uh, like could barely stand to be outside, but we got all kinds of shots and we sat down to do our interview and Ben had a whole list of questions and he wasn't, he told me he wasn't quite sure where it was going to go, but it just felt like everything was flowing towards telling this story of the church I grew up in and what that was like and how we ended up shifting away from that and ultimately going on this this journey of rediscovering God and rediscovering faith and how that looks very different than how I was raised and how it makes people really uncomfortable sometimes and all of those pieces of the story that I haven't told. Um, But that ended up being the episode and and Ben tied it together with the story of our homestead and Wyoming and, and my horses and the soda fountain in such a spectacular way. But as we were getting ready to launch it publicly, I had that same butterfly, butterflies in my stomach, much like I did the day we painted the soda fountain bright green. And I'm sitting there thinking, you can't, I'm not hiding anymore, right? I'm going to allow myself to be fully seen. And, it, and it's time and it feels good and it feels right. Um, but man, it just feels like stepping on a, off a cliff every single time that happened. And sure enough, it went live and um, we survived. And I got some incredible feedback from those of you. I had people tell me they needed to hear that. They'd never heard anyone say the things I said, and it gave them solace, and it gave them solidarity, and it gave them hope. Um, I had a couple of people angry about it, thinking they needed to save me, thinking they needed to convert me back to where I was supposed to be. That's okay. I figured that would happen. Um, but again, it was that same idea that I appreciated the kind words. I really did. There were several emails that made me cry because they were so kind and so supportive. But I knew that regardless of what anyone said, even if they said they absolutely hated everything about it and hated my story, that I had to do it. And so honestly, I didn't even look a lot of the, at a lot of the comments. I looked at a few um, and I read the emails that people sent me. But as far as like the public comments, I chose not to look at them because I'm like, it doesn't change the fact that I wanted to tell this 
story. And it was time for me to be fully seen and not hide behind that facade of like just leaving it a little bit fuzzy and not telling people who I really am and what I really stand for. After the episode came out, uh, someone, a a friend of ours watched it. And I think it made them maybe a little uncomfortable. And that's okay. It's okay to be uncomfortable. It doesn't, it doesn't kill you to be uncomfortable, right? But she asked me, she's like, why did you choose to talk about that? Why didn't you talk about something else? There's lots of things you could talk about in that episode. Why didn't you talk about horses or just horses or just homesteading or the soda fountain? And I thought about it. And, um, and I told her, I'm like, because I'm tired of hiding. And it's not like I've been hiding on purpose, but I think there's always pieces of ourselves that we're uncertain about, um, no matter how many personal development books we read or how developed we are as humans. I think that we always have those pieces that we kind of, we don't want anyone to see. And in my opinion, continuing to hide is, is a form of lying. And like I said, I didn't do that on purpose, but it, it doesn't feel good. It's just like when you tell a lie, it feels bad, right? And if you, you pay attention to your body, it almost makes you feel weaker. Have you, ever, have you ever experienced that? When you say something, even if it's not an outright bald face lie, it's just like a white lie, it kind of makes your body feel physically weaker. And that's what it feels like to me to, to hide pieces of who we are. Um, and not allow ourselves to fully be seen. So that is why I put it out there. And um, I'm glad we did. The thing I love about our life, and I know this is true for everyone, it's not just me, that that so many times the projects that we partake in and the homesteading life we choose and the businesses we run, um, yeah, they're about growing food and and making an income and all that. But it's really about deeper aspects and and growing us and, and learning. And if you just start paying attention to those lessons, there's a lot of really interesting uh, things and to be had and, and lessons to be learned. So hopefully that was helpful to some of you, or if anything else, you just kind of know uh, where I've been at and what I've been working through and thinking about lately. But that's why I'm just determined to figure out the places in my life that I have been hiding behind and, and just continue to expose them to the light and, and pull them out like little weeds because I find that I'm stronger and I'm bolder and I'm just a lot more happy when I do that. Whether that's painting a soda fountain green and, and standing on the corner and not being afraid to be seen or telling all the pieces of my story, not just the ones that uh, are easy to tell. Whew. So that's what I've been up to. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about small towns and maybe this is a little bit more of a takeaway for you guys. Uh, last episode with Allison, I talked about, we talked a little bit about her small town, which is way smaller than mine. Mine's 175 people. Hers is 22 people. So we're a metropolis compared to some towns. But man, this last year, I have become so passionate about little rural towns and um, preserving them and supporting them. And as the world gets crazier and big cities get a little more volatile and, and uncertain, I cannot encourage people enough to see if maybe small town America is right for them. And maybe moving to a place that needs you and your skills and your talents, maybe that is where you're going to find your dream homestead. And that can be an amazing opportunity for unconventional homesteading in its own way, right? Sometimes it's conventional homesteading because a lot of these rural communities were homestead communities like ours was. We had an incredible influx of homesteaders around the turn of the century. A lot of them didn't make it because it was so brutal here. They left. (laughs) I don't blame them. But a lot of them stayed and those old homesteads are still around today. Our house is an old homestead from someone who was here around the turn of the century. Um, But I think a lot of times when people are looking at purchasing property, especially right now where people kind of want to get out of city or get out of certain states, they're looking at the places that are homestead meccas. Good weather, a decent enough population where you can not have like giant cities, but you can still get all your needs met. Uh, Maybe a whole bunch of like-minded people, uh, a good growing season, all of that. Nothing wrong with any of that if you want to take that route. But a lot of times, especially now, those properties are very expensive and uh, hard to find, hard to get. You know, they're on the the market for an hour and then they're bought out in the bidding war. So maybe, just maybe, you might want to consider some of these little uh, off the beaten path towns, there's a, they have a lot to offer and they're waiting for people like you to invest in them. And so I wanted to give you a little bit of encouragement, encouragement around that. Uh, a couple 
things I've learned. And one of the first ones is, and this applies to any community you're a part of, even if you're just talking about a neighborhood in a big town or a suburb or whatever. Uh, but it's crucial. If you want to develop relationships and you want the community around you to grow, whether it's a neighborhood or a little town, you have to invest in it. And I, I, this has kind of become one of my, um, I don't know, soapboxes. What do you want to call it? You know, people compl- often, like they like to complain about their town. It's, it's popular to complain about your town. People do that with big cities and little towns. But people very seldomly put forth effort into their communities. The people who are complaining, they're, they're not putting that effort in. And I won't say everyone. There's lots of people who do. But what I would encourage you to do is if there's something you want to see in your community or your town, uh, be the one to start it. And it's not going to be easy. Like we talked about a few minutes ago, sometimes it's really hard. Sometimes it's a lot of effort. But uh, that's, that's what's needed, I think, to give or to bring revival to small town America. It's people who are taking action. And I've seen that in our town. You know, we decided to invest in the soda fountain. We have friends of ours who bought an old building across the street of us, and they're resurrecting it as a mercantile. Um, we have uh, other businesses that have moved in town. There's talk of some other initiatives of old buildings being purchased and refurbished. Like, it, it's contagious. So if one person starts it, maybe you, others will follow. That's exciting. But it just takes some visionaries. It just takes some people willing to stick their necks out, be seen, to stop hiding, to do the risky thing. Because yes, you buy a business, you start a club, you might fail. You absolutely might fail. That is a, that is a inevitable fact. But what if you didn't? What if you started the snowball of motion and excitement and community in your area? What if that happened instead? That, my friend, I think is worth the risk. So it's going to require some visionaries, probably you, probably you. You know, we're, we're trained, man, I, I covered this so much in my research for my book. I can't wait for you guys to read this chapter. Um, the history of consumerism in America. Holy moly. It was like my favorite chapter of the entire book. I dove deep. I mean, I knew it was there. I knew it was prevalent. I had no idea how prevalent and how much we have been educated to be strict consumers and so much opportunity for production of any kind has been, um, I wouldn't say taken away from us because we can still do it, but it's been, uh, we've been lulled to sleep that it's not important. And we kind of often have that mentality around our communities. So, so often I hear people say, and this, this is a pet peeve of mine. I don't want to move there or I don't like my town because there's nothing to do. Who says that someone else has to make something for you to do? I mean, that's kind of your responsibility, I would say. If you want something to do, then figure out something to do, right? And in my opinion, things to do doesn't have to always be an event or, you know, a festival in the park or some sort of arcade business or movies or whatever. It can be stuff that you're making or doing or creating in your home. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here a little bit because you guys are already doing all those things. But who says that things to do have to be created by someone else? right? It's that opportunity when we take on that higher level of personal responsibility and we can become the producer and the creator instead of just the consumer. That's when life gets real good. And it allows people around us to flourish and our communities to flourish. And I think that's what life is all about. So if you have a chance to invest in a small town, do it. That's going to take some time. Um, Sometimes, like I talked about with Allison in the last episode, People are suspicious of newcomers. That's just how it is. Don't hold it against them. Just be okay with that and be willing to prove yourself. Be friendly. Always wave when you're driving down a gravel road. Always wave. Like people are watching to see if the newcomer waves. I promise. Um, Throw yourself into the community. Be willing to volunteer. Be willing to show up. Be willing to encourage. Even if it's just, hey, I'll be there. I'll bring some cookies. Uh, Maybe you're not able to spearhead something right now. Maybe it's just saying, yeah, I'll I'll come. I'll show up to the community volleyball game. Your presence means a lot in a small town. And that's something that maybe it's easy to take for granted in a big city. You know, there's enough people that showing up and, you know, um, being different places doesn't mean as much. But in a little town, it means everything. When we have uh, warm bodies in the seats or people participating, that's everything. And it means a lot to the people who are pushing that town forward and trying to create growth and excitement. So be willing to be patient, invest in your community. Um, yeah, but it's, it's fun. It's worth it. And I so hope that one benefit of the craziness of the world around us right now and the turmoil and the uncertainty that I, as I hope it gives a little bit of a uh, shot in the arm to 
these small towns that are sprinkled around rural America. I hope it encourages some people to dig deeper into those communities and, and see what they can create because there's a lot of good to be found there. It's pretty special.